and welcome to the British Sitcom History Podcast. My name is Alan, with me as always is Gareth. Hello! Hello, hello. And this week we are talking about To the Manor Born, the smash hit from late 79 through to 81. Smash hit? It was a smash hit. Was it, it was smash a huge hit? success. Okay. It was indeed. Well, this is, I wanted to ask you this straight off, actually. Let's jump straight into it. To the Manor Born. Mm. First of all, this is we always have one show per series that is something I've never really seen and mm. don't really know much about over and above like the cl- yeah. just the general elements. So this is the new one to me. I, I, like I, I had to dive straight into the, to the Man of Born. Okay, but my my memory is oh yeah, this was a big hit, but yeah, it was sort of a you know for your mum for the mums. Yeah. And it's not that well remembered compared to other things of the time. It, it doesn't feel like it's been repeated mm. as much. It, so you were there in the 80s. Was yeah, this well, repeated? I, back I, so I, I remember To the Manor Born. I remember it being a thing. But I'm not sure if that would have been when it went out. So I was born in 1975. So, you know, I would have been sort of age three to six when this was on. So I, I don't know. I, I think I probably saw it in repeats. But when I say I saw it... You know, I've watched several episodes of this in the last couple of weeks, and I didn't remember any of it. So I, maybe I didn't see it. Maybe it was just one of those things. And if it was, as you say, a smash hit back in the 80s, if something that was a smash hit, you were aware of it, whether you watched it or not. I, I put to the man born for obvious reasons with they both star Penelope Keith. I put it with The Good Life in, in terms of yeah. my memories of those sitcoms that were on when I was little. But I, I know I didn't watch The Good Life because that was on before I was born. So... I, I, I suspect they occupy the same place in my head because I'd seen them both on repeats later. And it was just kind of one of those sitcoms for grown-ups that I saw. It's funny. I think The Good Life has much more of a repeat value. I think that's something I've seen myself on the telly loads, loads of times. But To The Man Born is not. But maybe that's just because I saw To The Man Born and thought, oh, I'm not watching that. Yeah. <laughs> like, who knows? But I will say that I was quite I was quite looking forward to watching it. But but as I said, it wasn't really refreshing my memory. Every single episode that I watched was new to me. I, I didn't remember a mm. moment of it. So it was a completely new experience, really. Uh, well, I will say, Gareth, To The Man Born falls into a category I, I know you're familiar with of Sunday evening programmes. Yes. This, this did originally go out at sort of 8.30 on a Sunday evening. Ah, uh, okay. Well, that's interesting, but I don't associate... We, we talked about this with uh, with Last of the Summer Wine, where I hear the music and I, I get anxiety because I know I haven't done my homework for school tomorrow morning. <laughs> I don't get that with Tamara Bourne. I guess this was long before I had homework. Yeah, so it, it's it's that category. That's a specific time slot. You're not aiming at the youth there, are you? This mm. is... But who, who is this show aimed at? You know, what what do you think? Because obviously it takes p- place in the sort of upper classes, mm. the, the, the big knobs, but... It's not exactly laughing at them, but it is sort of going, this is a slightly ridiculous life, isn't it? Yeah, I think it's also slightly aspirational. It's a sort of, you know, the, the peasants watching how the other half live and uh, and, and getting to see, uh, you know, getting a sneak preview into that life, but also having a little bit of a snigger at them because they're a bit ridiculous. But it is all very gentle, isn't it? Yeah. Um, I think that goes back to the writer. I think that's actually mm. down to him. It's Peter Spence. Who, who is the writer? Yeah, no, I must admit, I, 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 I didn't know that name. Obviously, when doing my cursory research for this, oh, Peter Spence, I don't, I don't know that name. So tell, tell me more about him. So Peter Spence was was a writer, but he was... Uh, you know how many times we've talked about writers on this show and they've all basically come from sketch comedy, radio mm. sketch comedy. Mm. That seems to be how you get in, particularly at the BBC. Yeah. That's just how you get started. Well, with Peter Spence, similar story, but he was a gag man. He was a gag writer, not even sketches. He, ah, okay. You know, he, he, he did jokes. And that is strange when you watch To The Man Are Born because obviously it's a sitcom and it's not even particularly gag heavy. You know, it's not... It's not a show that is predicated on gags. It's much more sort of character driven, yeah. isn't it? And it's very gently humorous. It's, it's just sort it of is gentle. Amusing. I think that's a good word for it. There's, there's. I think there's a lot of satire in this, which I'm sure we'll talk about. But, but it is all very gentle. It's all very. Uh, hmm. Mary Whitehouse isn't writing into the BBC about to the man of born, <laughs> is she? <laughs> well, the, so Peter Spence, he's not quite from this world, but he's also not. Uh, apart from it either so like he's not posh posh but i mean he went to boarding school for example you know he's not yeah. he's not he's, there's a certain sort of element going on there but he was married into it so where to the manor born was filmed mm-hmm. in somerset called cricket st thomas that's his in-laws house ah okay so grantley manor is is where his wife grew up uh, yeah and and so he 
lived near there. After he got married, they lived nearby. And he was an outsider looking in Mm -hmm. and he saw kind of all these kind of funny things going on and going, oh, that's interesting. That would make a good character, that sort of thing. But at the same time, he was part of that world. And I think that really comes across. This is not a show where people are going, oh, ha ha, look at the posh people, aren't they silly? Mm -hmm. This does feel like it comes from within. Like it's it's a more true account. But then it also has enough distance to just be able to go, okay, that is a bit ridiculous, isn't it? Yes. And I think that's a perfect place to be, just on the fringes of a society, in order to be able to comment on it in a a Mm. humorous way, but also with some sense of respect. But I think that's also an interesting perspective of, we'll we'll go into this in a lot more detail later, but the elements of satire, which are very much of their time at the turn of the 1980s, which are this old money, which is personified by Audrey and and the nouveau riche mm. which is yeah. personified by Richard so perhaps Peter Spence is that araviste that that young man coming into this world and perhaps there's a little bit of not being made to feel entirely welcome that he's channeling yeah maybe i i've never heard him say that specifically he also cites a, a specific influence in that a fellow writer who had obviously done pretty well he was a comedian i think he didn't name who it is but this someone who had done very well for themselves uh had bought a country estate so had thrown a sort of party and get to know the locals kind of thing yeah and the woman who used to live there came along and basically lectured him <laughs> on these are the things you have to do as a as an owner. yeah and so that was obviously the implanting in the in his mind that that uh-huh. concept and this all came about at a time just after The Good Life had been a huge success, Mm. Penelope Keith had become a huge star. And so it was well known in the corridors of the BBC that everyone was looking for a vehicle for Penelope Keith. Right. So he put together a a script, uh, Mm. which was for radio. This was a a pilot script for radio. Oh, really? Okay. And they they made that. And originally it was, our nouveau riche character was an American. Ah. Okay, that's a slightly different emphasis. Yes, uh, played by Bernard Braden. But that was so good, everyone liked it so much that they just kind of went, we we need to put this on telly, let's go straight to TV. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, you know, Peter Spence was a a radio writer. I don't think that was particularly his intention. But um, but yeah, there you go. That's kind of how it came about. And it was not exactly written for Penelope Keith, but certainly was written with her in mind. Yeah. And, and Well, yeah, I think, you know, you said there, the powers that be thought, yes, Penelope Keith would be perfect for this role. And I, well, she is, isn't she? Well, I think she's great. I think she does a really good job in yes. this. She's perfect for it. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and if you think in terms of her character from The Good Life, it's mm. uh, it's an obvious step, isn't it? It's, an, it's yeah. an easy fit. Well, look, before we before we get into the actors, we've already talked about Peter Spence. We haven't really mentioned the episode that we're going to cover. Do you want to tell us about that? Yeah, so just the, the kind of overview of the show uh, started in 1979, late 79, and then a, another series the year after, another series the year after that. Mm-hmm. And... Uh, that was it and th- there's a sort of very definite ending to it as well we'll yeah, kind that, of come to that we'll come to that later but but they they tie a knot in it don't they they finish it all off yes they tie the knot in it yes Quite. and <laughs> 25 years later they come back and do a 25th anniversary special yeah we, well we've watched the 20 we've watched that 25th anniversary special and we will talk about that later but for now yeah. let's stick with our episode which is classic era to the man of born season one episode five the summer hunt ball it's just a really good example from that first series of the dynamics of the characters. It's got yep. all the kind of the, just the regular ingredients. Before we explain the plot of this episode, let's just give a little bit of a setup here. The, the premise mm-hmm. of To the Man of Born. So the first episode, Audrey Forbes Hamilton, which is Penelope Keith, her husband has just died and she's left as the heir to this Grantly Manor. So she's the lady of the manor. But unfortunately, mm-hmm. it transpires during that first episode that the husband has died, bankrupt, loads of debts. She has to sell the manor to uh, Richard Devere, who is Peter Bowles. So now mm-hmm. Audrey is living in a, a much smaller lodge on the grounds from which she can see Richard ruining her beautiful home. So uh, yeah. that's that's kind of the setup. So she's her nose is out of joint. She's literally been booted out of her home. And the love-hate relationship between Audrey and Richard is what provides all the all the narrative thrust for the drama. Mm, yes, yes. And and that that is it. That that's all there is going on really. It's it's it kind of it's just the dynamic between the two of them. Mm-hmm. Everything else is just fringe stuff around them. Mm. But that's all right. That's enough. Uh for, you know, I don't you don't yeah. need to get too complicated with these things. So 
if we jump into our episode, mm. uh, like I say, this kind of has all the major ingredients. The summer hunt ball needs to be organised. It's always been Audrey who does it, but she's not at the manor anymore. So why should she do it? Richard has to take responsibility, mm -hmm. but obviously she can't actually stop herself from uh, getting involved. Yeah. And so it's a sort of uh, the push and pull, the power play between them in terms of trying to get one over on each other and mm -hmm. all that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. we op the opening scene is in a local shop. So we've got some fringe mm -hmm. characters here. There's the, the, the lady who, who runs the shop and there's the brigadier. He's trying to renew his driving license. And of course, it's all computerized now. And the brigadier character is just this classic d doddering old fool. I mean, he's basically the major from Faulty Towers, isn't he? <laughs> yeah, yeah it's kind of very similar. Yeah. Those are recurring characters, although that's the first time we see the Brigadier. Mm. He He's brought in specifically for this episode, and obviously he's quite a significant part of this episode. And they obviously liked him enough to kind of go, okay, let's just make him one of the villagers. We'll pop him mm. back in every now and then. So he pops up and throughout the next couple of series as well. And the shop owner, Mrs. Patterson, that's, again, it's just you know, a, a recurring character whenever they need to go to the shop mm. with a really conflictory relationship with Audrey. For some reason, she Audrey hates her. <laughs> yeah. And it was incredibly rude to her. Well, Audrey's incredibly rude to everyone, but we'll, we'll get to that. Yeah, that's true. Um, but yeah, so Anthony Sharp there is the Brigadier. Mm -hmm. I'm sure you recognize him. He's just one I, of those I faces. I recognize his face. Yeah, where do I know him yeah. from? I don't know if you'll know specifically because he's one of those people who's just in one episode of Rising Damp and Steptoe and Sun yeah. and, and all that sort of stuff. Uh, he is in A Clockwork Orange, sort of fairly significant role in that. Okay. Like might might be, might have seen him in that. This conversation between the two of them, which is actually quite a rare thing in the show that it doesn't involve either of our two principal characters. Mm, that's right, you know, yeah. We don't generally see that much fringe stuff. I, I think the base at the point of that is to set up that character because we're going to see him for the rest of the episode. Mm -hmm. And then uh, uh, Audrey herself wanders in and we get our first look as she comes in through the door we get our first look at a terrible backdrop oh yeah <laughs> which is supposed oh, no, I'm to glad be a, you brought this up because this is definitely a, a recurring problem throughout <laughs> so the sets we've obviously got this grantley manor which i didn't know is the writer's in-laws place so they've got a beautiful yeah. set so the exterior shots are great but the studio shots the studios are fine the the, the interiors are all good but the, yeah, the backdrops. So, you, you know, the, if there's a door open, you can see a really poor matte painting of fields and trees yeah. outside. Yeah, and it is quite consistently poor all the way throughout. Yeah. It's, I guess it is difficult to replicate the outdoors, mm. <laughs> indoors, you know, and especially it, this is supposed to be out in the country. It's nice and well lit. You can't hide mm. it in the shadows. You can't put too many top trees in the way. And it's, it is just a symptom of the, the process you're doing, but... Mm. I've certainly seen it done a lot better. <laughs> it's so well, consistently it stood out at me. quite poor. Uh, the, the, there were four occasions. I watched uh, six episodes of, of this uh, in the last week, and there were four times where I wrote down, oof, bad set. <laughs> so, <laughs> so it wasn't just a one-off. Yeah, yeah. And it, it, this one jumped out at me in this particular case mm. because it's supposed to be a road and you sort of see a couple of buildings and it's like you can, well, it's a painting of some roads. <laughs> so this is the first in this episode. So Audrey comes in and she she tells us that she's a magistrate. She gets that in in the first bit of the conversation. But she also... I wanted to ask you about this, Gareth. Yeah. What the hell is a magistrate? And why is it just the job that is given to the posh woman who lives there with no qualifications whatsoever? Why has she got power, legal power over people? Well, magistrates courts, are they deal with things that don't go to the crown court. So uh, relatively minor, relatively minor crimes. Generally speaking, they, they can't issue custodial sentences. It tends to be just fines. And the idea is that magistrates are all lay members. In other words, they're not legal professionals. They're not judges. Mm. They're, they're respected members of society who are giving something back. Now, in the time since To the Man of Born was made, the Justice Department, as they are known now, have made a lot of effort to try and make that a bit more inclusive, bring in more people from working class backgrounds. Part of the problem is that to this day, it's still very much a voluntary role. So there's no financial reward for doing it. It requires a lot of time. And so if you are working class and you, you need to make a living, then who's got the time to do that? 
Right, that makes sense. That feels very out of date now. Mm. <laughs> I mean, but in 1979. I think in the, in the world of To the Man of Born, it sort of makes sense that she, she is, would be that kind of self-appointed oh, yeah. custodian of the community, you know, there to put people in their place, which is mm. exactly how she sees the role. But yeah, not how I see the role. I think that's disgraceful. But that's exactly <laughs> how she sees the role and thinks that's perfectly okay. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, so in this very episode, she basically says... I'm the magistrate and I'm not going to let you do this in order to mess up your plans because it's not what I want. In a very sort of petty one-upmanship on someone. Yeah. So that, you know, it's just a blatant display of how open to corruption that is. (laughs) Yeah. But we, we, but so this is our first look at at Audrey and, you know, we've already sort of given a bit of an impression here as to the the, the kind of character she is. She's very self-absorbed. She's mm-hmm. kind of like Margot from The Good Life, but but extra, even more so. But actually posh. Yes, <laughs> rather than just pretending to be. She's she she does live the life, but she's fiercely proud of it and she's fiercely defensive of it. Mm. So can we just talk about Audrey Forbes Hamilton for a while? Mm-hmm. Because I think she's quite a nasty person and unpleasant. I agree. But it never quite falls into your sort of Phyllis Lumsden territory. I think we're always yeah. just about on her side. I think for me, I'm I'm just over the line. Like I I, I don't quite like her, but I think I'm supposed to. No, I th- I, I think you're right. I I don't like her. But I don't think we're supposed to like her. I think we're supposed to see her get her comeuppance. And that's yeah. that's the gentle humor of it. And that's fine. Mm. You're right. If she was any more nasty, it wouldn't be funny. She's manipulative. She lies. She takes advantage of people. But she's just sympathetic enough to get away with it, I think. I think it's pitched just about right. Only just. Yeah, yeah. And I think... There's definitely a lot of times where we're laughing at her and yes. her kind of ideals and her old-fashioned ways and, and that sort of thing. Uh, and I, so I think that's very knowing and deliberate. But yeah, she just gets away with a bit too much for my taste. And there's also a lot of things that go unmentioned or kind of just going to go, well, yeah, that's fair enough. And I appreciate it's just I'm from a different world and it's a different time. But like, for example, she has a butler called Brabinger mm-hmm. who is just sort of this indentured servant in yeah. her life, you know, has nothing other than to serve her and is very happy with that. Yeah. And it's just like that whole concept just makes me feel physically sick. <laughs> you, sound like, you sound like Lister trying to get Crichton to break his programming. <laughs> <laughs> exactly yeah exactly he's programmed into it like he he seems happy enough with his lot yeah yeah and so there's things like that that are just a never quite questioned there's that there's it's privilege she has so much privilege and as much as privilege you can kind of word. prod her pomposity a little bit there's just so much more that needs to be popped but we'll we'll talk about in this episode you know she's she's pretty manipulative in terms of how she behaves but just going back to that first episode where we see the funeral, her husband has, has just died, and she is delighted that he's dead. Like, she yes. literally does a little dance after the funeral because she's so happy. This is obviously before she realises that he's left her with so much debt that she can't live there anymore. But yeah. I, I kind of think, well, uh, clearly that must not have been a very loving relationship. It, it, are we supposed to assume that it's like a, I don't know, like a kind of arranged marriage as it would have been 300 years earlier? Kind of. I I read somewhere, I don't remember getting this from the show at all, but I was reading something and it said that they were cousins, her and her husband. Okay. But she is a Forbes Hamilton. Like she was Mm -hmm. raised in that house. Yes. So maybe she was the one who had the land and he married in rather than she married in. Or was it that she had to be married so... Perhaps. You know, because a woman couldn't have the land. It doesn't make sense. I, I, I sort of wrote this, a couple of notes on this as well, and I couldn't quite make it all add up. Yeah, I'm not quite sure. And also, you know, and this is another thing that comes in throughout. You know, she's been running this manor for years, and she knows how it works. And knows, mm. But yeah, but it has been just, you know, hemorrhaging money all that time. Yeah. And she says that everything she's doing is the best way, but... It no longer, either she's just wrong and she's not running it as well as she thinks, or times have changed and you can't run a manor in that way. Yeah, so I think that's the case. I think I think that's the case. And you saw, even earlier than that, the example that keeps coming into my head is, is Churchill's father. Sorry, well, Churchill's mother was American. And back in, when was that? That was like the mid-19th century. There were a lot of landed gentry who would marry American heiresses. So they would kind of get some money in mm. but and be able to maintain their you know, their landed positions. And that, you know, at the time, that was seen as very much marrying down. But it was for the money, you know. And that's the crux of this whole thing. Audrey has the titles and the land, but no money. Richard Devere has the money, 
but no class. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Sup- supposedly, exactly. yeah. But we'll we'll get into him. We'll get into Let's that, le- yeah. <laughs> yeah, too much at once. Okay, so let's uh, get back into the plot a little bit. We we uh, we we establish basically that the hunt ball is going on, and Audrey normally organizes it, but she's not going to this year because she's no longer at the manor. Mm-hmm. So that sets up the the plot for this episode, you know. Well, it does, but it also gives us the first our first moment uh, in this episode of the the racism that sits just gently below the surface in this in this sitcom. Mm. So the brigadier wants to organise the ball. She tells him, you need to speak to Devere. And, and the brigadier sort of pulls her face. And uh, the rumour is he's not quite English. And this is, uh, this is clearly something that is a repeated trope throughout the series. We know because we've already met Richard's mother, who is from Czechoslovakia. Yeah, and so is he. He sort of mm. came over as a child, mm. but he has this very cut glass English accent. Mm. You know, he's he is every bit a British gentleman apart from the lineage. So he's not classy. He's not from that landed gentry. Worse, he's foreign. Yeah, that's that's different. <laughs> Presumably, this is never actually said out loud, but it all feels like a little bit anti-Semitic. I'm presuming that the character is supposed to be Jewish. He's Robert Maxwell is who he is. He's yeah, a Czechoslovak, yeah, yeah. the, the bouncing Czech. That's what they used to call mm. Robert Maxwell. Yeah, yeah. I think that's definitely a, a deliberate evocation, even if it's not based on his character. I mean, know, in 1980, like... Robert Maxwell, this was before his, his death and his disgrace, That he, you know, the revelations that he'd stolen all that, those millions of pounds of pension money. But even then, he was a hugely controversial character. He was viewed by British society with exactly the same suspicion that we see Richard de Vere encounter here. So he had money. He was he was richer than a lot of those people, and didn't they resent it? He was constantly ostracized and rejected from the establishment that he was desperate to get into, and he was bitter about it. He was bitter about it. He was uh, he used to throw his money around and make people suffer. Now Richard mm. de Vere doesn't have that malevolence, that that sort of nastiness, but it, you know, he certainly bridles against against the establishment that are trying to put him down he he does to an extent and that's another thing where to the man born is very gentle and sometimes too gentle like sometimes it's like well let's just have some conflict for god's sake richard devere the character the, the whole idea is like oh he's not he ain't from around here and yeah. he's not one of us and he's not doing things we, we that he should be doing in this position but he's always wants to yeah he's basically like Tell me what I'm supposed to do and I'll do it. Yeah. Help me do it. I want to be I want to be part of your little your little group here. I want to be part of your little thing. And mm. like basically over the whole course of this, that's how they end up getting closer because mm. she'll teach him the ways of that and then and, and he rubs off on her, maybe mm. don't be as judgmental and all that sort of thing. But ultimately there isn't a lot of conflict there because he just wants to be part of it. And sometimes he can't because he's busy, because he's actually mm. doing a proper job of work. He's not just the Lord of the Manor. Yeah. We we get a couple of episodes quite late on where they start to resolve the whole plot of the whole series, the last episode of series three, where, you know, he gets pulled up by the fact that he's not part of the old boy network and mm. That's right. in the city, he's trying to get business done and they're just sort of cabaling against him. Which and, again and is a is a complete it. Maxwell you know, that's that's what happened. He basically ended up having to run his own company he couldn't get any funding and clearly the way he went was to steal lots of money but but that <laughs> but, but the point is people didn't know that then what they knew was maxwell had stuck two fingers up to the rest of the city because you know i'll fund it myself i'm a better businessman than all you put together and so they close ranks on them yeah, mm, yeah exactly and I, and i think just to sort of jump to the end there audrey finds a way to help him uh, overcome that yeah, she fights. She helps him fight that system because over the course of this series, she's learned that mm-hmm. just because he's from a different world doesn't mean he's not a good person. Yeah, uh, and and so that's a very nice and like I say, very gentle kind of growth be- between the characters. And it is, I think, this to the man born. You know, those three series it, it develops, doesn't it? The characters develop, their relationship changes, and ultimately mm. they get married. But I, I like that. I like that. It's not, we're not just resetting every time. It is a bit samey. I will agree with you there that the, the, the conflicts are basically the same and there's nothing revolutionary that happens, but at least there is an arc. There, are, There is character development. Yeah. I mean, you could do this in an hour and a half film. Yeah. Like that's enough, that's yeah. enough time to do that character arc and probably enough plot as well. Sure. <laughs> but that's fine because a sitcom, you do just go with the status quo. So to just have that little bit of change, that little bit of growth, and it kind of all comes together, perhaps it just changes quite a lot right at the end because they're like, oh, we're going to finish. We better tie it tie it together uh, rather than it being a, a, a growth throughout the whole thing. Mm. Well, before we go back into the episode, we've talked now about Audrey Forbes Hamilton. Why don't we talk about Penelope Keith? 
Give me a bit mm-hmm. of background on her. I, obviously, I know that she was in The Good Life, but that's about all I've got. So tell me a bit more about her. Uh, Dame Penelope Keith, if you don't mind. Oh, yeah. uh, give her a proper title. <laughs> She's someone who was interested in acting ever since she was a child, you know, and uh, went to a, a boarding school where they encouraged creativity and, and theatre and stuff oh, like that. <laughs> and, What's wrong with maths? <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, yeah, normal story, you know, get started in rep, ended up, at the RSC, uh, so kind of posh rep. But she was too tall and too plain looking <laughs> as a woman <laughs> to, to oh, be wow. kind of in that. And this is in sort of in her own words, as in this is what people thought of me. Yeah, That was what people saw her as. You're mm-hmm. not going to be a leading lady. You're not a young starlet. You're a bit weird looking and mm-hmm. too tall. And so she, she kind of lent into comedy and character okay. roles quite early on. Uh, her earliest TV credit is actually an episode of The Army Game oh, okay. in 1961, the last series of that. So when she would have been on that. How old was she then? 1940. Right, okay. So 21. Okay. So she'd have been 20, 21, something like that. She was also in the pilot episode of Wild Wild Women. Oh, Wild Wild Women with Barbara in Windsor. In 1969. Yeah, yeah. Well, she wasn't in the series. She was just in a pilot episode. So that, that, just to remind everyone, that's the that was the period spin-off of The Rag Trade. Yes, yes, a sort of 1901, yeah. <laughs> something like that, yeah. Uh, and But yeah, basically it was the good life that made her name. She was um, just a, a sort of a working actor doing little character roles here and there, doing theatre. And the good life, we're not reviewing the good life today, but the good life was huge, wasn't it? It was a really big mm. cultural success. Like, you know, people yeah. still talk about, if someone's got an allotment, oh, it's like the good life, 45 years later. Yeah, yeah, it was a huge hit. And, and so they were all... Those four stars of The Good Life, they were all like, right, like, what can we do with them now? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Obviously, Richard Breyer's... Ever Decrease about... in Circles was next for him. Well, Ever Decrease in Circles, that didn't start until about 90... Maybe not quite that late, but it was certainly wasn't the next thing he did. I mean, right. he probably did about eight sitcoms mm. in the meantime. Mm. Richard Breyer's got more sitcoms uh, on his CV than anyone. So Felicity Kendall, she went and did... Uh, the was it solo or then the mistress or the other way around but the mm. Carla Lane shows mm-hmm. that we've talked about before mm. and uh, of course um, Paul Eddington did Yes Minister of course yeah what's Penelope Keith going to do what's what's her big next thing and as we talked about Peter Spence kind of came up with this for her uh, so yeah this was her next thing and it was a huge hit and she is great in the role you know we talked about oh, yeah. what we think of the character but she portrays it really well yeah. And and so when this was finished, just to put that into a bit of context, obviously they only did three series of this and it was a big success. Mm-hmm. The producers certainly wanted more. And I think it was, I mean, I've certainly heard Penelope Keith say this. She was the one saying, we need to tie a bow on this. We need to, mm-hmm. we can't just do will they, won't they forever. We need to yeah. go one way or the other. And so they they wrap, they wrapped it up. So I don't know if she was just ready to move on or, or what, but uh, certainly the way she tells it, she wasn't prepared to do any more. Mm-hmm. But they also talk about, you know, they certainly had a good time doing it and they seemed to enjoy it. But afterwards, after the show, she did several sitcoms in the sort of the decade after that okay. as well. But I wonder how many of these you remember, because like I say, I it's going to be your kind of period. Before you go through the list, I don't know anything else that she was in. So go on. So the first one she did in 1983 was called Sweet Sixteen. Nope. In which she plays a sort of an older lady who starts having a, an affair with a, a, a young man in his 20s. Interesting. Just a one series thing. I don't think people were ready for that yet. Uh, 1985, something called Moving. That was, again, a not really a success. That just did one series. 1986, Executive Stress. Ah, no, I do remember that. Was that Jeffrey Palmer? Yeah, she's a she's a woman who decides to go back, rejuvenate her career. You know, yes, I think after the kids are, are no longer a, a hassle. A nice little role. And so, yes, that was Jeffrey Palmer in the first series. But then after that, he, for whatever reason, he wasn't available. Mm. So they had to replace the actor playing the husband and they brought in Peter Bowles. Oh. So that was their kind of little reunion. Well, that's interesting. So obviously I remember that as Jeffrey Palmer and not the Peter Bowles connection. I don't think he quite caught the imagination of the public in the same way uh, because, uh, you know, it didn't have the same thing. Here's another one, which I've never really seen. I've watched little some bits and pieces of it, but I'd love to see more of this. 1990 to 92, no job for a lady. I don't know that, no. The first episode is she arrives. She is a new MP, a Labour MP, who has just won a by-election, and she is in the House of Commons. Wow. And so it's uh, it's all about her life uh, as an MP. I've been thinking a lot about political sitcoms recently. We were talking about the difference between Yes Minister and In the Thick of It. 
and obviously there's New Statesman. But that's another one. No job for a lady. Yeah, and look that up. It's on YouTube actually. But like the whole like series one as one video, like a three hour video. That's what I was watching bits from. Um, I'd really like to see more of that. I don't know much about it, but uh, yeah, it seems very interesting. And she's she's a Labour MP. It kind of <laughs> when you think of Penelope Keith, that's not what you mm. think. <laughs> but it but it's actually quite nice. It's I, first time I've seen her do something a little bit different to what okay. you think. I'm gonna of have a look Penelope at that. Keith. That sounds interesting. So that one, that one was in the early 90s then. Uh, in 1994, Law and Disorder, in which she is a, a lawyer. Mm-hmm. Uh, again, just one series there. And then 95 to 97, Next of Kin, Ooh. about a retired couple who have to take in their grandkids because the, the, the parents right. die. Now, yes. So I do know about this because I watched some of this quite recently and it is brutal. Yeah, she's a really nasty piece of work. Penelope, yeah, so so the, the, the setup is that Penelope Keith and her husband inherit their grandchildren because their daughter has died. Yeah. And they don't give a damn either way about the fact their daughter has died, about the fact that they've now got these kids living with them and they couldn't care less about. It's absolutely brutal. It's It's like a... <laughs> portrait of abuse yeah i've seen a few clips of that i haven't actually watched uh, full episodes and yeah it does seem pretty brutal and i've heard her talk about it and she's she sort of seemed to enjoy doing it but perhaps just a bit too on the nose for for the yeah for, i think it'd, the, be, uh, it'd be interesting to watch audience. a bit more of that but it certainly didn't work for me in the clips that i watched mm. oh god this is yeah not very pleasant so and and really that's sort of in terms of a sitcom career that's the end tail end of it she's done plenty of theater work over the years as well we just went through a list there of, well, 15 years of sitcoms. So mm. consistent work, only two of yeah. which I can remember. Only, I think, two of which went to more than one series. Mm. So it sounds like there was no overwhelming success there, but clearly not a complete failure because they kept having another go. Yeah, I think that's basically right, yeah. And more recently, she's done a she's done factual TV, Penelope Keith's Villages, I remember being on, which is a yeah, yeah she- her going around little villages, meeting people... In blackface, and that's that sort of thing. <laughs> <laughs> Is that what it's about? Is that it? Well, I haven't watched it, I assume. <laughs> so 1940, that means she's 80 now, right? Yeah, she's 82, she's yeah. yeah. She, she, she doesn't act much. She hasn't acted much for, for 20 years, really. All right, well, look, let's, uh, that, that's great. That's a really good, uh, that was a really nice tangent. She is, the, she is definitely the... The beating heart of this of to, to the Man of Bond. Let's let's go back to our episode she, then. So she is though. You know what? Right. She when you think of the to Man of Bond, it's, it's okay. Yeah, it's Audrey and, and Richard. It's mm. Penelope Keith and Peter Bowles. It's Audrey's show. Yeah, certainly. Richard Devere is the love interest. Sort of the will they won't they the 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 antagonist as such. Mm-hmm. It's it's all about her. Definitely. I, and I think we've not mentioned Marjorie, her friend, who is the third character mm. in this drama. Um, and we'll yes. talk about her in a minute, but. I think that we've got Audrey at the top of the tree here in terms of the char- of what this is about with Richard and Marjorie as supporting characters. I agree, yeah. An antagonist and a friend, a kind of a, a confidant. Yeah. yeah. And then the butler, you know, that's her, her thing as well. Mm-hmm. And I think, I think that's very interesting to have, even though this is nominally about sort of two principal characters, it, it's centred around a woman, it's centred around a strong woman. And that yeah. is something Penelope Keith has obviously... Um, specialized in over the years but just to put that into a bit of context this series came out three months before margaret thatcher became prime minister Mm -hmm. Uh, and i i I think the idea of strong women (laughs) and if you look at the think about those sitcoms i've just been talking about Mm. those sitcoms are all about oh what is this strong powerful woman doing in the in the 80s you know it's they're all kind of pushing this, uh, these female characters, oh yeah, women want to get back to work and like, the, the, here are the struggles. Women are becoming MPs. Here are the, and like yeah. the, I watched the first episode of No Job for, I mean, the title's No Job for a Lady. Yeah. I watched the first episode of that and it's very much about her encountering sexism from these kind of old boys in, mm. in the House of Commons. Which I'm sure would, would have been, you know, true to life. Yeah, at a time when Margaret Thatcher was the Prime Minister still, you know, it's like, it, there's, obvious, there's, there's an obvious precedent <laughs> that women are in the House of Commons. You think about women MPs now. Uh, 1997, you know, they, they called them Blair's babes, which is not very 2022. But 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 the point is, there was a huge influx of female MPs in the 97 landslide, and that yeah. really changed the the dynamics. It changed the numbers. It's still it's still not nowhere near 50 50, but you know, it, it, that that was a big generational shift. And I think before that, there were women in the House of Commons, but there was an element of 
you had to play you had to play the old boys game and you know margaret mm. thatcher certainly didn't play the old boys game in 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 many ways but she wasn't a feminist she, she you know she was a this is the way i'm going to operate and you can like it or not she wasn't trying to blaze a trail for other women she wasn't trying to change policies in the same way that someone like say harriet harman was mm. so i think that the theme of to the man born is that audrey forbes hamilton doesn't want to be the lady of the manor. She wants to be the lord of the manor. And she wants, mm. to, she wants to take on the boys at their own game rather than to change the game. Yeah. I think Penelope Keith was ahead of her time in terms of the parts she was playing. Mm. And the success she had meant that people were writing parts for her and writing to those strengths. And To the Manor Born is a perfect example, is, is the one that was successful because all mm. the rest didn't do well because people were like, uh, the woman yeah. in power, I don't want to watch that. <laughs> but mm. To the Man of Born was about a woman falling in love, ultimately. So it was okay. Mm. <laughs> I think that's, they sugared the pill enough. And and like I say, he's probably the most unpleasant character that she is in all of us. Yeah. Well, maybe not yeah. the uh, next of kin. Let's take, let me take you back to our episode. So we, we've we've had that scene in the shop that we've, we've set up that there's going to be this ball and that the, ma- the, not the major, the brigadier is going to talk to Devere about it. Mm-hmm. We also find out that Audrey, being mischievous, has already sent out invitations to the ball, even though it doesn't mm-hmm. exist yet, just because she wants the ball to be a disaster, which will make Devere unpopular. I don't think it's necessarily she wants him to be unpopular. She wants it to be clear that she's required. And I wish we could get into this a little bit more in the show and, mm. and let her be a little bit emotionally exposed a bit more often. That would be nice. I think mm. that would help see a softer side. But yeah, it, it, she has had her purpose taken away. Like that manner mm. was her life mm. and her job and it's been taken away from her. Mm. And with it, all the respect that came with it. And people don't respect her and they don't like her. People don't want to be around her. They respect her position. And respect her power. And that's why it's so important to her. Right. And a nice character arc would be her learning to just be kind of a, a good person and herself. But, you know, the character arc is keep going at it until you get it back. <laughs> so, yeah. you know. Yeah. But we, we could feel sorry for her, but we don't. I certainly don't. Well, so we, with the next scene, I quite enjoy the next scene. It's a good introduction to Richard Devere. So the Brigadier now goes from the shop. He goes up to the manor to talk to Richard and basically ask, request permission to have the ball at the manor. Mm-hmm. And what's interesting about this scene is that we're kind of expecting Richard to say, goodness me, no, this is a home. This is not, this is not for the community to come and have a ball. This is, my, this is where I live. But he just yeah. says, yeah, no problem. <laughs> and the reason is he's busy. He's working and we see him. He's sat in his office. He's making phone calls. He's, he's doing it. It's a very 1980s caricature of I am working. I have answered this one phone. Now I will pick up the other phone. Oh, there's a fax coming he's in. He's got three it's, phones, Gareth. It's, it's so the, busy. It's and they're all such different a funny colors. little caricature. <laughs> but, but, but the point is that the brigadier is, is dawdling and wants to have a chat because he's got nothing else to do. Mm. Whereas Richard is trying to make a living. Yeah, he's watching the stock prices on CFAX. It's very busy. <laughs> very busy, man. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's just like a lovely little uh, cartoon of busy. <laughs> but yeah, so that's what I mean when I said earlier, like he's not he's not trying to break up their traditions or change yeah. things. He, says, he yeah, just have the wants ball. to live but in then, a big house. But then the, the next point is the Brigadier says, so, so uh, will you organise it then? And he says, God, no, I'm not going to organise it. I haven't got time to do that. So that's that's where the, the, the comedy moves on and the tension moves on because somebody's got to organise this ball. Who will it be? This is the other thing. The Lord of the Manor doesn't organise the ball. His wife organises the ball. The exactly. Lady of the Manor organises the balls. And he hasn't got a wife. Just another failing of his. Mm-hmm. <laughs> another reason why he's not good enough for the man yeah. Uh, and, and that's sort of peppered in throughout you know he needs a woman to organize his home life so he can just get on with his work but that so this is the first time in the episode that we now see richard's manipulativeness mm-hmm. so he wants audrey to organize it but he knows that if he asks her to she, she'll say no so he tries to manipulate her successfully by asking audrey's friend marjorie to organize mm-hmm. the ball and of course, yeah, it, you know, it transpires Audrey's so disgusted that Marjorie's been asked that she takes over, just as Richard had predicted. So that, that's kind of the, you know, that's kind of the setup here of what happens. Mm-hmm. Shall we talk a little bit about Marjorie here as a character? 
Yes, this is when we first see her in this episode where her and Audrey are, well, there's Audrey spying <laughs> on Richard mm-hmm. to see what's happening. The, the, the concept between these two characters is they've grown up together. You know, they know it's such a, mm. they've known each other since they were little girls. They were at school together, all this sort of thing. They're old, old friends. So throughout the series, we see Audrey treating Marjorie like crap. Uh, but this episode yeah. is actually, I think, the worst of the lot, where they really <laughs> kind of fall out and she's extremely sort of unpleasant to her. Mr. Devere has asked me to organise the Hunt Ball. He must be out of his mind. <laughs> the idea is to raise money for the hunt, not to put it in the hands of the official receiver. <laughs> well, I don't know why you're so cross. Mr. Devere said you said you wouldn't do it. Well, how does he know? He hasn't asked me. Well, you told Brigadier Lemington you wouldn't, so he came to me, Mr. Devere, and asked me to help on bended knee. You should have refused. Devere was supposed to come to me on bended knee. <laughs> but yet, yeah, Marjorie as a character played by Angela Thorne she's incredibly tolerant she's very tolerant but is she also a little bit dim <laughs> i think the idea is she's she's still a big she's never quite got past the schoolgirl phase she's just a yeah. kind of like oh jolly hockey sticks and, um, and when girl a, when guys a, when a she man leads the shows interest in her she sort of goes wide eyed and says who oh, calls <laughs> yeah exactly which is a it's a very sweet kind of character it's a bit of a classic yeah. thing but and a perfect performance i think uh, from angela thorne all all the way through mm. really i think she's mm. note perfect on everything i think it's a brave move to pit audrey with uh, another character who is nicer than her <laughs> is yeah. is uh, you know much more pleasant friendly the only failing she has is she's not good at running a stately manner <laughs> that's basically uh-huh. the only fault she has yeah and she obviously she fancies richard yeah. whereas audrey does but won't admit it marjorie's just like oh gosh he's so handsome <laughs> gosh. <Look> at his <laughs> eyes <laughs> and that becomes a bit of a thing. Like never, he never gives her enough of a sniff to uh, to kind of really cause any proper conflict. Mm-hmm. Uh, but he he likes to uh, flirt with her every now and then. And I just think that's a brave decision because it's just like why don't you just like Marjorie instead? <laughs> like she's obviously so much nicer. Yeah, 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 exactly. And, and when yeah, when all's said and done, it makes a lot more sense, doesn't it? And it sort of ruins the logic of the show. <laughs> but yeah, poor old Marjorie in this particular episode gets totally done over because they both richard uses her as a pawn to mm-hmm. to get audrey to do it once and audrey just slags her off to her face and just basically yeah. calls her a useless <laughs> yeah. uh, whatever so yeah poor old marjorie she kind of occupies that role within the drama doesn't she she's a bit of a doormat but she's there mm. as a as a useful foil for for audrey mm. what about angela thorne the actor well she's got a sort of similar background to penelope keith in a lot of ways she was in terms of a class system, you know. Mm. So she was born in India. Mm, Obviously, me. that means her father was, you know, I think he was a doctor in the in the military. Mm. Uh, and so she ended up being brought up in a boarding school as well in Britain. Yeah. You know, she got sent off to that. And so she's in that very kind of upper middle class mm. uh, bracket as well. Very familiar face, Angela Thorne. Well, she's done all sorts of bits and pieces, little smaller role, like little mm. odd character roles here and there. She she appears in an episode of The Good Life um, mm. a couple of years before this. And, you know, just a general small-scale TV and theatre career. And then this this role was the one that kind of made her a bit more of a, oh, yeah, yeah. everyone knows who she is now. When I was watching this, I, I my first thought was like, she'd be an obvious choice to play Margaret Thatcher in something. And so I, I looked that up and, and she did indeed. She In a play called Anyone for Dennis, which was, oh, right, okay. uh, you know, it's about her, Margaret and Dennis Thatcher. And they did a, a film version of that as well. She did some other sitcom stuff, though, after this. So obviously this raised her profile. So uh, in the late 80s, she was in a sitcom called Three Up, Two Down. Ah, yes. Remember, remember that? Very yeah. well with uh, Lizette Anthony, who I had strange feelings for at my young age. Fair enough. Yeah, yeah. And uh, Ray Burdis with hair, mm. uh, with someone's hair. And Michael Elphick as the... Um, <laughs> Michael Elphick. As the, uh, so Michael Elphick, they were in-laws. Michael Elphick and Angela Thorne were his mother and her father, respectively, of, yeah. or maybe the other way around. And yeah. they were forced <laughs> to live together and much hilarity. He's, he's working class. She's pl- posh. Mm-hmm. Hilarity. I, I, I enjoyed that as a kid. Right. Yeah, that Good seems enough. fair enough, isn't it? That's fair enough. And then it, also around the same time, she was in Farrington of the FO uh, about a woman working in the foreign office. But uh, yeah, that's um, a very sort of Thatcher-esque mm-hmm. foreign office lady goes to the colonies and mm-hmm. has to put them right about something. I'm not quite sure. I haven't yeah. seen it, so I'm not quite sure. That. But that was another sort of lead role, you know, a lead role. 
and then she's gone on to sort of play old ladies and things. Uh, but those that, that was kind of the eighties were her real noted years when she right. was a bit of a bit of a star. Her husband actually, uh, Peter Penry Jones, he's in the last couple of episodes of To the Man of Born. You know they're trying to take over his business from him. John Barron, who plays CJ in the original Reggie Perrin run, he's he's one of the business sharks, isn't he? That's right. And the other one who they're trying to take over, uh-huh. uh, called Gayforth, uh, that's her husband. In, Gayforth. In so life, Gayforth is, is Peter yeah. Penry Jones. Yes. And if that name rings a bell, that's because Rupert, Rupert Penry Jones is quite a famous actor these days. That's oh. their son. Oh, okay. Uh, yes. Okay. Um, so he was in spooks and stuff like that. He's uh, okay. pretty sort of... He's one of those faces, like, I had to look him up. Like, I, I recognised him, I, I knew the name, name, but I couldn't really, I haven't really watched anything he's in. Because he's been he in any sitcoms, because sitcoms, that's nah, the... Nah, 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 nah. No, 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 no. <laughs> so that's Angela Thorne. And like I say, her and Penelope Keith, I kind of had similar backgrounds, and it was sort of within that world of these characters. They knew what it was like to to be the jolly hockey sticks girls at boarding school and, and join the girl guides and, and all that yeah. sort of stuff. Yeah. So I think it falls into those characters really nicely. I think they the two of them have a nice dynamic together. Okay. All right. So back to our, our episode. So in the next scene we have, we're in a marquee and Audrey is basically running things t- mm. t- for organizing the ball. I mean, she's literally standing on a soapbox in the middle of the room, <laughs> just shouting that, yeah. orders around, moving people around like chess pieces. And she's an absolute nightmare <laughs> well i wrote that down as well that exact note she is literally stood <laughs> on a milk crate i said but yeah, yeah she, so she can look down on everyone yeah, <laughs> so, yeah, yeah you know we get a bit of humor here there's an army uh, you know uh, yeah uh, so sergeant there's a company major sergeant major a, comes in classic in, shouty sergeant major yeah i mean it's it's all you might as well be windsor davis for all <laughs> for the caricature that he's doing but yeah he's shouting because he's in the army Squat, prepare to dump tables over there. You will dump them nowhere. You will put them over there. Ma! <laughs> Quietly. <laughs> Ma. Squat! <clears throat> By the left. <laughs> Quick, march. Left, right, left, right, left, right. You get like a five minute bit out of that with her... Yeah just calmly domineering this shouty man just to show her power. Uh-huh. They have a whole bit with the brigadier where they're going back and forth. None of that means anything in terms of the plot. It's just no. a bit of comedy. Yeah, yeah okay, we, let's fill a few minutes here. That's fine. And fair enough, you know, that's fine. It works. That's all good. I, that, that scene was great. It, it, the, like you say, it's not not really plot relevant. It's just a bit of character, a bit of, bit of comedy, all, all a bit silly, you know, but yeah. good fun. And then we get... A real life black person into the Man of Born. I think yes. the only one. <laughs> yes, in the and show. and it's and because it was 1978 and we needed a black person. It's Paul Barber from Only yes. Fools and Horses. <laughs> well, yeah, of course, this was before Only Fools and Horses. Yeah, uh, exactly. But yes, it is Paul Barber, Denzel out of Only Fools. And, and of Horses. course, he's there to play kettle drums, and he's smoking a joint. Yes. So he is referred to as the Jamaican steel band from Taunton. The accent he's doing is neither Jamaican nor <laughs> West Country. Mrs. Forbes Hamilton, man. No, Mrs. Forbes Hamilton. It's real cool. Where's the gig? Who are you? McLeod. Mackenzie McLeod. Oh, yes. You're the Jamaican steel band from Taunton. <laughs> but that is very much the diversity box ticked for To the Man of Born. <laughs> There's one person in the first episode who is supposed to be an Arab. Uh, I'm pretty oh, sure he yes. wasn't. <laughs> is it, no, no, I remember that scene. So that, that scene is, there's an auction because as we said, they're bankrupt and they, the, the, the place is about to be sold and ultimately Richard is the one that buys it. But, mm-hmm. but one of the bidders is, in quotes, an Arab. <laughs> it's just basically some, some geezer that was in Doctor Who last week who's got a towel on his head. It's, it's that, the characterization is that blunt. Let's be fair. The world that they are showing is white people. Like, yeah, that's an accurate representation. Sure. And, and and in the early eighties, they that was fine. You know, it didn't matter. No, no, I think you're right. I think I think that had we not been having this conversation about the Arab and Paul Barber, we probably wouldn't have noticed there were no black yes, people. Yes. But that's because we're both white men. But that would not be inaccurate. I I think the summer hunt ball is going to be a fairly white affair. <laughs> Yes. I don't know why they've hired a Jamaican steel band for it, to be honest with you. That doesn't seem to fit the general tone of the, no, of the thing. That's very true. But there yeah, you yeah, go. Yeah. So did you notice that 
she as the organizer of the hunt ball she's there she's got like a sort of a white smock on which is obviously her work clothes mm. and she's wearing a big badge that says organizer in <laughs> I didn't letters. notice that no no is that just in case you weren't sure <laughs> just, but then when marjorie comes along she's got the exact same thing on as well <laughs> so someone's obviously making these badges for them not homemade i did not notice that that's very funny <laughs> Well, that's all we've got time for this week, but do join us again next time where we will be looking at To The Manor Born in even further detail. And of course, we will be looking at Peter Bowles' career as well. In the meantime, do go and check out our social media, Instagram, Twitter. We are at BritcomPod. Get in touch. Let us know your thoughts of To The Manor Born and we will have more info for you next time. Bye.